This video will be a summary of the mechanism of RNA splicing. So splicing involves removing the introns from that RNA that's been produced from the process of transcription. And I just want to point out that prokaryotes do not have any introns. Um, so it's only eukaryotes that have introns. Furthermore, um, the higher organisms tend to have more and larger introns. And so, for example, yeast, which is a very simple eukaryote, um, most of the genes don't have any introns at all. So only 200 out of the over 6,000 genes in yeast have any intron at all. Uh, Drosophila, something sort of intermediate, uh, most genes do have introns, but you know there are not so many of them, and these introns tend to be fairly small. In contrast, humans, um, most genes do have introns, um, and some have quite a few, right? So many, many exons and introns, and the average size of the intron has increased significantly so that the intron on average is much larger than the exon. A lot of people wonder whether there's any um, any advantage for eukaryotes in having introns uh, interspersed among the exons. And there's certainly arguments, you know, as to what those advantages might be, evolutionary type arguments. Um, one clear advantage of having introns is the ability to do something called alternative splicing. And the idea here is just that a certain gene may use mix and match their exons in different combinations to actually make different proteins. Um, when the first when the genome was first was first sequenced, people were very, very surprised at how few genes humans have, you know, compared to some of the lower organisms that had already been sequenced. Um, only about 21,000 genes, but the difference here comes in the fact that there's so much alternative splicing. 70% of human genes are alternatively spliced, and what that means is that there's a whole bunch more proteins, that can, possible proteins that can be made than there are genes. And so here's an example of one gene that undergoes significant alternative splicing. And you can see that in, you know, in different tissues, you have different forms of the gene being made. And, you know, presumably many of these proteins have slightly different functions from each other. Um, there are a wide variety of ways that alternative splicing can happen. Here is kind of a summary of different things, and I'm not going to go over these in depth, but I just want to point out a couple. So sometimes you can either use or not use an, a, uh, an exon, okay? Um, sometimes you can have intron retention instead of, you know, having it cut out. Um, there's also such things as alternative uh, promoters. And so here you have two alternative places where the gene can actually start. And each of these has to have their own promoter. And so these two might be actually separately regulated or differentially regulated. So let's talk next about the actual mechanism of um, how splicing occurs. So first of all, the factors that do the splicing reaction um, are made up of a complex of RNAs and proteins. And um, the RNAs are called SNRNAs, or small nuclear RNAs, and they complex together with a bunch of proteins to form this complex that are called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, which is kind of a mouthful, but they're short abbreviated SNRNPs and oddly enough this is pronounced SNRPs by people in the field. Okay, there are five different SNRP complexes. So these are called U1, U2, 4, 5, and 6. And this is the structure just shown here of one of the one of the SNRPs, U1 and it's showing that there are four different proteins together with this RNA which kind of uh, ties them all together. So how do the SNRPs know where the introns lie on that RNA sequence? So uh, they recognize them due to sequence features in that RNA. And so what's shown here are the, um, the preferred sequences um, for that splicing machinery to recognize that there's an intron present. And so here's an intron, uh, intron shown in brown. And at the very beginning of the intron, there 
100% of the time you will find a G followed by a U. Okay, so all introns have to start with these two bases, and at the end of the intron, they have to end with an A and a G. So these, 100% of the time you see them, there's one other base that is absolutely required, and that is somewhere between 15 and 45 bases upstream of, um, or before the end of that intron, there is a position called a branch point, and at that branch point there has to be an A. So 100% of the time we see an A. Now there are other bases that are preferred, and so for example, um, you see a number of numbers uh, of bases here. Um, the third position, for example, in an intron, it's preferred that it's either an A or a G, and 95% of the time you'll see either one of those bases. Um, we're going to focus on the absolutely required bases, and so that's just summarized down here. And so the beginning of the intron, the end of the intron and then that branch point A are absolutely re required. And the beginning of the intron has another name, it's called a splice donor, whereas the end of the intron um, is called the splice acceptor. Now I'm just going to summarize the two steps that are involved in this process and then we'll talk about it in more detail. The first step that happens is that that branch point A um, attacks the beginning of the intron and actually makes a bond with that, with that G at the splice donor. Okay, this forms a little loop in that RNA, and then it releases the end of this exon, to which then attacks the um, beginning of the next exon, forming a bond between those two. Okay, so you end up with those two exons spliced together, and the intron is released, and it's released in this lariat form. It's a loop with a little stem there. This whole thing is catalyzed by the SNRPs, and so uh, here is the here's the intron that's going to be cut out, and these SNRPs bind to different regions of that intron. So U2 binds to that branch point A, um, U1 binds to the splice donor, the beginning of the intron, um, and then once those two are bound, uh, the the position of or the presence of an intron has been identified and these three other ones will bind and will form this complex that will then lead to uh, and catalyze the two reactions that we just talked about. So that A um, attacks that, that G, makes a bond there, then making the lariat, and then this OH at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, first exon will attack that G or that um, position at the at the start of the next exon and splice those two exons together, releasing that lariat. The molecular changes that occur here are two transesterification reactions. And so the first one involves this formation of the lariat, the A binding with the beginning of that intron. And I just want to point out that that A is part of an RNA, um, an RNA sequence. And so the 5' prime and 3' prime ends positions are, are already taken up, binding in that, in that RNA strand. And so it is the 2' um, OH that actually attacks that phosphate group at the beginning of the intron. That's the first transesterification uh, reaction. The second one is the joining together of these two exons. This OH attacks the phosphate at the 5' prime end of the next exon. I just want to point out something pretty surprising, uh, which is that the enzymatic activity for this reaction is actually done by the RNAs themselves. And so the SNRNAs are called ribozymes. They are actually acting as an enzyme in this case, um, but this was you know, the very first time that it was actually discovered that RNAs can actually act as enzymes. Okay, and we'll just end up by uh, revisiting something that we've talked about before. And so um, earlier in the course we talked about how you can actually get mutations in introns which can lead to you know, loss of the function of a protein. Um, now you guys know that, okay, the really important sequences are that GU, okay, at the beginning of the intron, and the AG at the end, and then the branch point A. And so if one of those is mutated, 
the cellular machinery is not going to find the right place to uh, do the splicing. And a couple of things can happen. So, you know, one possibility is that you can actually just not recognize this as an intron and it'll stay in. Another possibility is that it might actually um, cut out one of this, these exons. And so this is what happens in an example um, in a human disease, cystic fibrosis. And there, there have been a number of mutations that have been identified in cystic fibrosis patients. This is a really common one. And so there's a, a, a mutation, I think it's in the splice donor site, um, in exon 9. And what that means is that um, Exon 9 is not really recognized, is not recognized as an exon, and so it gets spliced out, and so this splice acceptor site at the end of exon 8 um, gets joined together with the splice donor site at the exon, at the end of, or the beginning of exon 10. Okay, if exon 9 is skipped, you end up with cystic fibrosis, whereas if you splice correctly, you have a normal phenotype.